uh, if you if you go there and click on the actual problems, uh, the solution video um, is there. And uh, for example, for this one, uh, the solution video is uh, I've, I've specified to go, go to the uh, three minutes, 40 second mark on the video for the video explanation of uh, a two-tailed hypothesis test finding the critical value. And here's uh, what we're doing is a two-tailed hypothesis test. So uh, to do that, what you would do is open the um, the uh, video. You can start it me, and then immediately pause it and uh, just simply go out to, and you can see at the bottom next to the little speaker icon is uh, the where I am and there, uh, three minutes and 41 there three. So there I am at three minutes and 39 seconds. And if you start there. Uh, hypothesis test is a hypothesis test that will take place when the alternative hypothesis has the inequality symbol not equal to, not equal to. Okay, so uh, there is help. Uh, but we'll be going through this problem and the other problems um, in the uh, classwork nine. And to read the problem, it says, find the critical value for a two-tail hypothesis test in which alpha is equal to 1%. Assume it's a normal distribution and run your answer to the thousands decimal place, which is the third decimal place. So, um, the first thing we have to do is um, set up what this is going to look like. And um, what I've done here is to um, talk about the uh, critical value in a two-tail hypothesis test. And in the video, it says that the two-tail hypothesis test is going to be hypothesis tests in which the null hypothesis is equal to and the alternative is not equal to. And not equal to is another way of saying that is uh, less than or greater than. So when the alternative hypothesis is not equal to, then we have a two-tail hypothesis test less than or greater than or not equal to. We're assuming it's a normal distribution, which means we'll be able to use z-scores. And the next thing to do is to uh, talk about uh, the alpha, which is the level of significance in this hypothesis test. We have a, a two-tailed test, which means the uh, critical value is going to be found in two tails uh, for an alpha of 1%. So what this means is with a 0.01, uh, which is 1 one hundredth, uh, we would have to divide that by two to get the area in the two tails of this normal distribution. So with the 0.05 area in these two tails, what we're being asked to find when we're asked to find the critical value is what is the z-score uh, on the x-axis uh, for this area of 0 0.005. And the function in the TI-83 or TI-84 that is responsible for that is if we go to the, first turn it on, um, the distribution button. So I'm going to hit the second key, then the distribution button. And the number three in the list of distributions is the inverse normal function which is the function that we'll be using. So we press the inverse normal function, and then we put in the area, which is to the left of the z-score that we're trying to find. And here I'm going to put in, uh, first let's press three to show you how this works. The area to the left is going to be 0 0.005. Uh, the mean of this distribution is, uh, zero, and the standard deviation is one. And now we come to paste 
And here we have the input into the normal distribution. By the way, if into the inverse normal distribution. By the way, if you only put in 0 0.005, it would work also. So when I press enter, now I have this number, which is the uh, number that we're going to be taking to the thousands place, which is the third decimal place. This is the negative Z score, but because of the symmetry and because this is a two-tailed hypothesis test, that means that the Z score, which is the critical value, is going to be not only the negative, but also the positive. So the answer is the plus and minus. Now, this uh, is using an answer key that is an open-ended answer key. In, in our um, problem, we have choices. And you'll notice there are two choices that use both the plus and minus sign. And the number that we're looking for is the 2.576. So we'll be using, in my list of answers, it's answer number two. But you, you would answer, of course, whichever the correct choices following that. So now I'll check the answer, and uh, that is correct. Um, for those of you who came uh, in, uh, please go to the um, please go to the um, chat room and just type hi, and uh, that's how I'll be taking attendance to award extra credit. And today we'll be doing Classworks nine and ten. And uh, this is uh, available at the end of unit two. So uh, with that, I'm going to go on to the next um, problem. Uh, on, the, um, on the next problem, we're going to be looking at uh, a critical value in the T distribution. And that's what the title of this question is meant to, um, is meant to signify that we have the critical value in the T distribution. And it says find the critical value in the T distribution for a left-tailed hypothesis test in which alpha is equal to 0 0.005 and n is equal to 20. Now on the learning aids, uh, there's a solution video that I think you'll find quite um, straightforward and will lead you to the solution. But what you're going to need are T tables. And under the learning aid T tables, uh, what you can do here is to download the uh, T tables. Uh, when I open this up initially, I don't see a place for it to download. But if I kind of stretch this out, there we go. Uh, you can see that here we have a place to print. And here's where you can download the T table. I have two of them here. One is, uh, uh, they're both the same. Uh, I kind of prefer the first one, but um, there's a second one, and uh, perhaps you'll find that one more to your liking. Uh, but I'll be using this T table to do this uh, particular problem. So we're dealing with a left tailed hypothesis test for. Um, an alpha, a level of significance of 0 0.005 and n equal to 20, which is the sample size. Remember the T distribution is uh, the distribution we use whenever there's a the data list or when the um, sample size is less than 30. For sample sizes that are 30 or more, we can use the, the Z distribution or the normal distribution. So uh, to show you how this one gets done, um, I prepared this so that we can go straight to it. First of all, the critical value in a T distribution for a left tail test. First question is, well, when would we have a left tail test? And the answer to that question is, whenever the alternative hypothesis is less than. So the alternative hypothesis is what tells us the tail that the particular hypothesis test is in. Our alternative hypothesis would have to point to the left for this to be a left tail test. 
which by the way means that the null hypothesis would be greater than or equal to, or at least. We have an hypothesis test where we have a level of significance alpha of 0 0.005 and the n is equal to 20. The level of significance is the area in the tail of the hypothesis of the um, distribution that we're going to be using for this hypothesis test. And it's the tail on the left. Under the T distribution critical values, T values, um, this is the T values here that we're going to be looking for. The first thing we have to do is look and see where can we find the area in one tail of 0 0.005. So here we have area in one tail, and here we have 0 0.005 as the area uh, of uh, the found in that left tail uh, for this alternative hypothesis of less than. So our answer is going to be somewhere down this column. So somewhere in this column is our answer. To find out which one of these values, we have to then consider what is the sample size, which is going to tell us what are the degrees of freedom. And the formula for degrees of freedom is that the degrees of freedom, or DF, is one less than the sample size. So coming to this uh, column, we decide which of these values by looking at the degrees of freedom of 19, 20 minus one. And when we do that, we have uh, 2.861 from the table. However, we have to remember that this is a left-tailed hypothesis test. And in a left-tailed hypothesis test, the critical value is going to be a negative. So the answer is going to be a negative 2.861. Now, if you have questions as we're going along, please uh, feel free to just simply unmute yourself and uh, just uh, interrupt me at any time. Will do, will do. Great, thank you. Okay, the next uh, question in this uh, classwork nine, and as I said, we're going to be doing not only classwork nine, but also classwork 10, uh, is student T hypothesis test is the title, which tells, kind of gives things away a little bit, but what this means is there's a question about uh, a hypothesis test, and they're telling you that we're going to be using the student T distribution, but let's see why. Um, assume that the simple random sample has been selected and the test and test the given claim. Um, the average age of actresses when they win an acting award is 34 years old. So here we have our claim. And when we're doing a problem like this, the first thing we need to do is to simply uh, write the word claim. So down here, uh, I've got how I work this out. Some of it's not as pretty as uh, using uh, typing, but um, I, I simply wrote the word claim. And the claim involves the average age. So the average is the Greek letter mu, which uh, I'm doing, just going to use u on the, on the uh, keyboard. And mu, the average is, which means is equal to 34. So here is the claim that's being made. Mu is equal to 34. So the first step is to write the word claim and then to write the claim symbolically. Mu equal to 34. Before we can get to any of this other stuff, we've got to set up the hypothesis test by then writing or abbreviating the word opposite. 
And we want to write the opposite of whatever the claim is. And the way to do that is to look at the two symbols in the claim, mu and 34, and then rewrite them in the opposite. Then direct your attention to the equality sign between the two. And whatever this equality sign is, since this is going to be opposite, we need to put the opposite equality sign between the two symbols under opposite. And since this is equal to, the opposite of equal to is not equal to. And as we saw in the last uh, example, uh, not equal to, or in the first example, not equal to, it can be thought of as less than or greater than. So whenever we have a not equal to, uh, we know that we're going to be dealing with a two-tailed test. Getting a little bit ahead of myself though, right now all we have is the word claim and with the claim written and the word opposite with the opposite written. The next step is to identify which of these two has the equal sign. And the one with the equal sign in this case happens to be the claim. It's not always that way. It's the claim can also be the alternative. But in this case, the equal sign is the claim, and therefore the claim is called the null hypothesis. The claim isn't always the null. It's the null hypothesis in this case because the claim has an equal sign. The alternative is the other one. And I simply denote the alternative by H1. The alternative is not equal to, which is less than or equal to. And it's the alternative that decides how many, you know, which tail the test is being performed in. It's being performed in two tails. So now we have our claim. We have our opposite. We've decided on which is the null and the alternative. And now we have to decide, well, which test are we going to use? When we go to the TI-83 or TI-84, and I go to the stat button and look at the tests menu, here are all the hypothesis tests that we're going to cover in this course, or the majority of them. The first two, you'll notice, just have a single letter, Z-test, T-test. The next has the number two. And what this two means is this is a test where we're testing a claim about two different populations. This is a one proportion Z test. This is a test about not a mean, which is what one and two are about. This is about a percentage. And that percentage is, um, a percentage that can be written as a proportion like 0.1 or 10%. A two proportion Z test is a test about proportions or percentages in two populations. So to make things easy, what we have to do is decide which of these tests we're going to use. So for the uh, calculator, how do you get to the, the Z and the T test? What we'll do is test Click on the stat button and then go to the test menu. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, please interrupt. I, I, I love it. That's great. So um, here we have the test menu. And because we have only one letter in the claim, in other words, the claim is not mu1 and mu2 because we're looking at two different populations. It's just simply mu, right? One population of actresses. Um, the mu here, one letter, means that we're going to be selecting a test that has the number one in it, or has at least doesn't have the number two. And then we want a test that tests about a mean. 
This has a number one, but this tests about proportions or percentages. It's the first two that test about a mean. Which one of these two depends on how many are in the sample that was used to test the claim. And here we see that the sample had an N equal to 27. The sample had 27 actresses in it. And whenever the sample size is 30 or less, then we'll use a T test. We'll also use the T test if it's a very long list. Uh, it's a lot easier to use a t-test than a z-test when there's a long list of more than 30 uh, data values in the sample. So we're going to hit the number two. And when we do, uh, we're going to look and see uh, the input. And the input in this case is in the form of uh, summary statistics. Uh, the cursor is on data. And that would be fine if we had a data list, but we don't have the list of the actresses' ages. We just simply have the summary statistics. So we're going to use the statistics input or stats input. So I'll come over here to stats, highlight it, and then click enter. And here now are the uh, inputs that we'll be putting into the calculator. The first thing we see is this mu subscript zero. This mu subscript zero, the little zero here uh, is meant to uh, be the zero that you see in the null hypothesis, the H subscript zero. And this is asking, what is the number you see in the null hypothesis? And that number in this case is the number 34. Then the next thing it asks for is what is the sample average? And the uh, problem states that the 27 actresses in the sample had a mean, um, X bar, sample average of 35.4. So I'll put in 35.4. The next thing it asks for is the standard deviation in the sample. And further on down the problem, it says that the standard deviation is 11.2. Then it asks, what is the sample size? And again, the sample size was given as 27 actresses in this simple random sample. By the way, that's what this SRS stands for, simple random sample. Finally, before we calculate, we're asked to select the appropriate inequality sign. And where we go for this is to the alternative hypothesis. So the little zero points us to the null hypothesis. This line of inequalities points us to the alternative hypothesis, the H subscript one. And we see that the inequality sign in the alternative hypothesis in this problem is not equal to. So we'll just leave it at not equal to. Finally, we'll calculate. And when we calculate, this is the output that we get. It's the same as the output here. So I'm going to kind of get rid of the calculator for right now to give us a little more room. So here we have the output under the t-test. Again, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> under the t-test, um, we have the t, which is the um, t score for this particular sample. Um, the t is 0 0.649. Five, the p-value, which is the thing we really concentrate on, the p-value, which is the probability that a sample like this could exist, 
if the average age was in fact 34. And they said it was about a 50-50 probability. So the p-value here is compared to an alpha of 5%. And uh, here they, uh, I believe they gave us the alpha. If they don't give us an alpha, then we assume that it's 5%. And as I read through this problem, uh, I'm not seeing an alpha that's given, which is perfectly fine. If alpha is not given, then assume alpha 0.05 or 5%. The p-value is always compared to alpha. And the slogan I give my students is that if the p-value is low, then the hoe must go. <laughs> and if the p-value is high, then the hoe will fly. In other words, if the p-value is more than alpha, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Fail to reject, you might be more comfortable saying support. So here we have that we're going to support the null hypothesis. Notice I didn't say that we're going to support the claim. We use the p-value to alpha comparison to decide about the null hypothesis. Because remember, it might have been the case that the claim was the alternative. In this case, the claim was the null. So we're going to decide to support the null hypothesis, which means we're going to support the claim because in this case, the claim was the null hypothesis. So as we go through the different um, selections in this uh, problem in homework nine, the selection that says the null hypothesis is mu is equal to 34 and the alternative hypothesis mu not equal to 34 is correct. We decide to support the claim, but the reason we do that is because we supported the null and the claim was the null. The p-value for this hypothesis test was 0.522. The correct decision to support failed to reject the null hypothesis. Yes, that's the decision we made based on this p-value. And because of that decision, we decided to support the claim. This final one is kind of trippy because it says for this hypothesis test, the test statistic, which is the number that we have here, is z equal to 0.65. But if you look carefully, this is not a normal distribution. This is a t distribution. And the test statistic is a t test statistic, not a z test statistic. So for that reason, this choice would be incorrect. So going to our, uh, going to our different, um, different selections, um, all of these um, were correct with the exception of the hypothesis test, the test statistic is Z. This is a T distribution. So the test statistic would have to be a T. And there we have the correct answer. In this problem, it just simply says mean for a hypothesis test. So we don't know if it's Z or T, but let's see. It says Kaiser Medical Foundation claims that the cost to rehabilitate a football player following a head injury is more than $28,500. To test the claim, the researcher um, surveys the medical billing records of 45 football players uh, who were treated for head injuries. The average cost for those 45 players was over $30,000 with a standard deviation of over $1,000. The actual cost, it says, is the actual cost of rehabilitation more than 28,500 as Kaiser claims? So the first thing we have to do is figure out what is the claim in this 
hypothesis test. That's where we have to start. And to test the claim, the claim is that Kaiser claims that the cost to rehabilitate a football player is more than 28,500. So the way this is going to get accomplished is to first start with the word claim. So we first need to set up the actual hypothesis test to be able to do this problem. So I start by writing the word claim. And then after writing the word claim, I write the claim symbolically. And the claim is about the average cost. It says the cost to rehabilitate, which we can take as being the average cost. The average cost is more than, is simply greater than, 28,500. So the first step is to uh, write the claim and write the claim symbolically. Step two is to write the word opposite. And then for the opposite, write the same uh, letter and the same number, 28,500. The symbol between these two in the opposite is going to point in the opposite direction as the symbol in the claim. So this points to the right, and this symbol is going to point to the left. The symbol in the claim has no equal sign, so the symbol in the opposite is going to have an equal sign. So when we are writing the opposite of the claim, we have to concentrate on the direction of the inequality sign in the claim. The opposite is going to go in the opposite direction. And we need to ask the question, does the claim have an equal sign in it? If it doesn't, then the opposite will have an equal sign. If the claim had an equal sign, then the opposite would not have an equal sign. Then the next step, the third step, is to decide, well, which of these two, the claim or the opposite, which of them is the null hypothesis? And the null hypothesis is the one with the equal sign. So notice in this problem, the opposite is the null hypothesis. In the last problem, we had the opposite uh, the uh, opposite being the alternative and the, and the claim being the null. In this problem, we have the opposite being the null and the claim being the alternative. Quite all right. After finding the null, the other one is the alternative. And now we're going to decide which of the tests in the calculator are we going to use. And then we're going to turn it on and go to the stat button, test menu. And because we only have one letter in the claim or the opposite, I know that it's not going to be one of these claims with a number two in it. It's not going to be number five, because that's a claim about a percentage or proportion. This is a claim about a mean. So it's either going to be number one or number two. And what's the deciding factor? Sample size. Is the sample size more than 30? And we see that the sample size with the records of 45 football players. So therefore, this is going to be a normal distribution or a z-test. So I'll just simply click enter, and here we have the z-test. The input is again in the form of a summary statistics. We don't have a list of data. So if there's no list of data, it's going to be summary statistics. The first input in the list of summary statistics is the mu subscript zero. In other words, in the null hypothesis, here's the null. What was the number that we found? The 28,500. So here I'll write in 28,500. The next thing I'm asked for is what is the standard deviation of the sample? Notice this says sigma, 
which is the standard deviation of the population. But because this is a sample of more than 30, the standard deviation in the sample can be used as a very good approximation of the standard deviation in the population. And that is one, one, two, three. Next I'm asked for, what is the sample average, the X bar? And the selected sample had an average of 30,885. And finally, the determining factor as to whether we use a Z test or T test is what is the sample size that was used? And the sample size was more than 30, which is 45. So there I have all my input in terms of the summary statistics. The next line talks about the inequality sign found in the alternative hypothesis. Remember this one comes from the null and this one comes from the alternative. If we go to the alternative hypothesis, here it is. I see that the alternative hypothesis has an inequality sign that points to the right. So when I come down, I'll go to the inequality sign that points to the right. And then finally, after I've got all of that input, I'm going to calculate. I have that screen here. And um, when I press calculate, here is the output screen. Notice the first thing it tells us is what is the test we used? We're using the Z test. The next is what was the alternative hypothesis? This is a alternative hypothesis because there's no equal sign. And we also can say that this is a right tail test. The test statistic is the Z score for the sample average that was taken. And that Z score is over 14. That's more than 14 standard deviations away from the mean. The thing that we really concentrate on significantly, though, is this number right here, the p-value. And Wait, now, so uh, to, yeah. to determine, to like figure out what's a z-test to a, a t-test, like you said, it would have to be uh, above 30, right? Which was, it was uh, 45 correct. football players? That's correct. Uh, okay, okay. So since it was 45 football players, we'll do the z-test? Correct. Okay, cool. Yeah, if it's 30, they say go with the t-test. Uh, that's kind of a mean thing, but because you say, you know, more than 30, but- uh, Is that what you're saying? Like the, if the P is higher or is that something different? Okay, so here, here down at the bottom here, um, let me kind of, this is in the way for me right now, how do I? Okay, there we are. I had this. So if the P value, well, let's talk about the P value. Here's the output screen. Uh, this says P is equal to 2.45. And you might look at this and say, well, that's a P value that's pretty big. But what does P value stand for? Uh, P value stands for probability value. And we know that probability can't be more than one, right? Probability values go from zero to one. So probability can't be two, there's something wrong. And what's wrong is we have to look down the other end of this line of numbers and we see this E negative 46. And what this stands for is the scientific notation, which is 2.45 times 10 to the negative 46. And what that number is, is a, a point zero, 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 45 zeros, and then the number 245. So this is really a p-value that's equal to zero for all intents and purposes. And the saying is that if the p-value is low, then the ho must go. In other words, if p-value is low, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Notice it doesn't say if p-value is low, then the claim must go. It says the null hypothesis must go. So here our p-value is as low as it can be. It can't be any lower than zero. So the p-value is low, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis. 
Let's find the null hypothesis. Here it is, the null hypothesis. We're going to reject this null hypothesis. Is the null hypothesis the claim? No, the null hypothesis, in fact, is the opposite of the claim. So if we're rejecting the null hypothesis, that means we're going to support the alternative. And the alternative is the claim that the average cost was more than 28,500. Going to the selections that we have for the multiple choice, uh, the p-value was zero. Uh, these are the correct null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, we decide to support Kaiser's claim. No, notice it doesn't say support the null hypothesis. We actually rejected the null hypothesis. We are supporting Kaiser's claim because when we reject the null, we supported the alternative and the alternative was the claim. These are incorrect null and alternative hypotheses. And it says for this hypothesis test, the test statistic was 14.25, which is the number here that we have, 14.25. The Z is the test statistic. So uh, just going to this problem, the test statistic uh, was correct. This was correct p-value is correct, and we decide to support the claim. This was the only choice that was incorrect. We really couldn't have two different null hypotheses. And when we check the answer, that is indeed correct. OK, so that's um, classwork 9. I'd like to move ahead to classwork 10. And classwork 10, we have also four problems. Uh, we have a one proportion hypothesis test, a student T hypothesis test. So we know what that talks about. And then we have two labeled type one and type two errors. So we'll get to type one and type two errors as well. First of all, the first problem, which is entitled one proportion hypothesis test. This is kind of a giveaway. What it's telling you is the test that we're going to be using to do this hypothesis test. But let's read the problem. It says a drug company believes that at least half, at least half, at least 50%, at least 0.5, at least half of all 13 to 17 year olds with autism will respond better to a new drug treatment for autism. A sample of 900 or a sample of 900 uh, of these individuals with autism found that 411 had responded better to the new drug therapy. Let P be the proportion, in other words, percentage of all teens of this age range who respond better. So the first thing we need to do in this problem, since we are asked a bunch of things about the hypothesis test, we have to actually set up, we have to actually set up the hypothesis test by writing first the word claim. So going back to the claim that is being made by the uh, drug company, it says that at least half at least is greater than or equal to. Um, and there is a, um, let me see if I have it in this. I have a solution video here that's pretty good, but um, there is a hypothesis testing vocabulary table that is available in the learning aids of the homework and uh, in the previous uh, classwork eight that you can download. Uh, tell the, which will give you the translation from words to symbols, at least is greater than or equal to. And it says, let um, P be the proportion or percentage of teens who um, uh, respond better in this age group. So it says the proportion, the percentage is at least greater than or equal to 0.5. 
or 0.50, 50%. So we just simply write the word claim and then write the claim symbolically. That's step one. The next is to abbreviate or write the word opposite and go to the two symbols, the P and rewrite it here, P, and then go to the 0 0.50 and rewrite it here, 0 0.50. Once you have that written, look at the symbol in the claim and the symbol in the claim is at least, so it's a greater than or equal to, greater than points to the right. So this opposite will point the other way, go to the left. This has an equal sign. So this will have no equal sign. So here I have the um, greater than or equal to, here I have the less than. So that's step one and step two. Step three is determine which one of these two is the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is the one with the equal sign. So the claim in this case, greater than or equal to, is going to be the null hypothesis. The alternative, H subscript one, is the other one. My claim is a claim about a proportion. And when I turn on the TI-84 and go to the stat button, and go to the test menu. I need to look for a test that is a test about a proportion. The first four tests are tests about averages. Averages in one population, comparing averages in two populations. Number five is a test about a percentage or a proportion. And number six is a test comparing percentages in two different populations, and it's number two. We're just looking at one population, and we know that because in the claim, there's only one letter. So because there's only one letter in the claim, we're going to be using one of the tests with the number one in it. And the one we're going to be using is a one proportion Z test, which was kind of the giveaway in the title of the question. The P subscript zero, remember that little zero points us to the null hypothesis. Here is the null hypothesis. And the number found in the null hypothesis is 0.5 or 0 0.50. So the number here is 0.5. And if you put in 0 0.50 and then come down, it brings it back to 0.5. The number of um, people who responded better in our sample of 900 was 411. The number in our sample was 900. And the symbol found in the alternative hypothesis, remember this one, we go to the null hypothesis, that's a little zero to get that number. This one, we have to go to the alternative. Here's the alternative hypothesis and the symbol points to the left. So in the alternative hypothesis, I'm going to select the less than symbol, and then we'll calculate. The um, things that I have here um, show the tests we're going to be using. Um, I also show the um, input screen. Here it is that we have here. And this is going to be our output screen, which will show as soon as I press enter. It says we're using a one proportion Z test. Here is the alternative hypothesis, P less than 0.5. The Z equal negative 2.6 is the test statistic. So here is our test statistic. Here is our P value. The p-value uh, is 0 0.004 or 0 0.005. Remember, we're comparing this to an alpha equal to 5% unless told otherwise. And as I read through this, there's no mention of the level of significance alpha. So we assume that alpha is 0 0.05, 5%. 
the p-value compared to 0 0.05 is low. And the saying is that if the p-value is low, the hoe must go. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Notice I didn't say we're going to reject the claim. Based on the p-value, we make a determination about the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is to be rejected. And in this case, the null hypothesis happens to be the claim. But as we saw in the last problem, the null hypothesis could just as well have been the opposite if the claim had been different. So here we're going to reject the null hypothesis, which means we would fail to reject or support, if you will, the opposite, that the percentage is less than 50%. The last number in our output, notice has this little P with a hat over it. It's actually called P hat. And this is what's known as the point estimate. In other words, this is the actual percentage that was in our sample. If you were to type in 411 divided by 900 in the calculator, you would get 0.4566 and change. So this is the actual percentage that was in our sample. Because the sample size is so large, that resulted in a p-value that was quite small. So as we go through the choices in our um, choices for this, uh, says p hat for, well, all of the choices are correct. <laughs> the p hat uh, was 0 0.057. That was the p hat that we saw here. We decide to reject the company's belief that at least half uh, responded to the um, new drug. Here are the null and alternative hypotheses. The test statistic, which was the Z equal to negative 2.6. And the p-value, we can say is 0 0.005 compared to 0 0.05. So that is uh, the problem for um, problem number one in classwork 10. Here we have a medical supply manufacturer claims that their first aid cream on average is at least, uh, has on average, uh, at least uh, 30 milligrams of active ingredient. The amounts of active ingredient vary normally from the tube, from tube to tube. Um, you select a simple random sample of nine tubes. Notice that's less than 30. Um, you select a simple random sample and assess the quality of active ingredients they contain. And here they give us the nine amounts. A hypothesis test is conducted using these nine tubes in the sample, which are the following statements are true or false. So to do this problem, we have to set up a hypothesis test. So as you go through doing these different problems, it's going to be necessary to set up a hypothesis test before you can answer anything. The first thing we do, since this is a claim, it says the manufacturer claims the first aid cream contains on average at least 30 milligrams. Again, write the word claim, and we have to write the claim symbolically. And the claim symbolically is that mu is greater than or equal to 30. Mu is greater than or equal to 30 is the symbolic representation of the average is at least 30 milligrams. Once we have the claim written, then abbreviate the word opposite. We write the same two symbols. In other words, where we have mu here, we're going to also have mu in the opposite. And where we have 30, we're going to also have 30 down here. Then we look at the symbol in the claim. 
and the symbol is greater than or equal to. So the opposite is going to point the other way. It's going to go to the left. And since the claim has an equal sign, this will have no equal sign. So we have the claim written up to this point, and then we have the opposite written. Next step is to decide which of these two is the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is H subscript zero. And it's the one with the equal sign. So in this case, the claim happens to be the null hypothesis. But as we've seen, the claim could just as easily have been the alternative for say a claim that the active ingredients were more than 30. But because we have a null hypothesis, which is the equal sign in the claim, the claim happens to be the null hypothesis which means the opposite is going to be the alternative. Now we have to decide again, which tests we're going to use. Notice it kind of gave things away, student T hypothesis test in the title. So if you come to a point where you're having any questions, always helpful to look at the title of the question, but to see where that is, I'm going to turn on the calculator and go to stat tests. And the test that we're going to be using is a test that is about a mean, mu. Notice there are not two letters, which we'll get to next week, two letters, uh, where we have one of these tests with the number two in it. Instead, this is a test about one mu. So it's going to be one of these that are not uh, without the number two in it. And then we have to decide, well, uh, is, it, is it a test about a proportion or is it a test about averages? And this is a test about averages, mu. And then finally, last but not least, which one of these are we going to uh, use, uh, z-test or t-test? And uh, in this case, we're going to use a t-test, and I'm going to scroll down here, uh, but unlike the other problems that we've done today, the data is given to us in a list of numbers, nine numbers. Those nine numbers will go into a list. I put them in list one. When we go to the t-test, this is what shows up. Up until now, we've been using the summary statistics as the input, but because of our data being in a list, we have a data list. The mu subscript zero is the number found in the null hypothesis. Remember when you get to this line, look at the null hypothesis, here it is. What's the number? 30. So 30 will go here. Since we have a data list, what list has the data? The list one in my calculator. Frequency will be left at one. And, and if it doesn't have the number one, put in the number one. And then finally, the symbol found in the alternative hypothesis. Remember when you get to this line, we're looking at the alternative hypothesis. When we were at this line, we were looking at the null hypothesis number here we're looking at the symbol in the alternative. Here's the alternative, and the symbol found in the alternative is the less than symbol. So we select less than and then calculate. When we hit calculate, here's the output screen. And the thing we look for to make our determination is the p-value. P-value, p-value, p-value. What's the p-value? P-value 3.36. Well, we know the p-value can't be more than one. p-value stands for probability value. So p-value can't be 3.36. There's gotta be more to it. And if we look down the other end of the numbers, here's e equal to negative four. This is scientific notation. This is 3.36 times 10 to the negative fourth, which is a decimal point 
If this is negative four, then there are three zeros and the number 336. How does this compare to an alpha of 5%? It says, and, and I think we were, we weren't given an alpha, which is perfectly okay. We weren't given a level of significance. So we assume that the level of significance is 5%. This p-value is less than 5%. P-value low, the whole must go. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis, which means in this case, we'll reject the claim because the claim happens to be the null hypothesis. So p-value less than alpha, reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, uh, we can support the null hypothesis. As we go through the different uh, <clears throat> selections here, the only two that uh, make any sense um, are the, the one that says uh, the claim, the null hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis are what they are given here. And the degrees of freedom are equal to eight. And that is because we had nine in our sample size. So the sample size here was equal to nine. So the degrees of freedom are one minus or one subtracted from n, n minus one, nine minus one, eight. So in this, uh, problem, we'll use the degrees of freedom, and here we have the uh, correct hypothesis. We support the medical manufacturer's claim. We saw that that was not true because we um, rejected the null hypothesis, which means we rejected the claim. It says uh, since p-value is greater than alpha or greater than 5%, that's not true because it was less than. And this one you might have selected if you weren't thinking, uh, p-value is equal to 3.36 because the output had the p-value 3.36. But remember, p-value can't be more than alpha, excuse me, p-value can't be more than one so anytime you see a p-value that starts out with a number more than one, look down the other end for the scientific notation. And this p-value certainly is not equal to uh, 3.36. It's equal to 0 0.000336. And uh, there we have our uh, correct answers. The next problem and the next two problems, um, I have a YouTube video here that's uh, pretty good. Um, you'll, you want to um, definitely download uh, this um, this um, type one and type two errors uh, learning aid. Uh, and uh, I have, I believe, I don't see how you can download that. Um, and anyway, this is the this is the um, uh, learning aid that we're going to be using: type two and type one and type two errors. Uh, this uh, is the columns are the true state of nature. Uh, in other words, it is true to say that the null hypothesis is true. And it's true to say this column is that the null hypothesis is false. So these are the true state of the null hypothesis being true and the null hypothesis being false. Our decision, we decide to reject the null hypothesis is this row and the fail to reject or support, if you will, the null hypothesis is the row below it. A type one error then is when we decide to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we say the one with the equal sign, we reject. 
when in fact, in the true state of nature, the null hypothesis is true. So this is, I, I liken it to the null hypothesis being true is, uh, like in a jury trial, where the defendant is innocent, and the, and the verdict, the jury comes back and says, he's guilty. That's a, a type one error, a serious error, rejecting the true null hypothesis. Uh, the probability of that happening is, is happens to equal the level of significance. But don't worry too much about that. The thing that I want you to be able to recognize is what is a type one error? And then what is a type two error? Well, a type two error happens when we fail to reject or support a null hypothesis, when in fact the null hypothesis was not correct, it was false. I liken this to a person being guilty and the jury coming back and finding him innocent. That's a mistake, but a worse mistake, I think, is when a innocent defendant is found guilty. Here, a guilty defendant is found innocent. So a type two error, failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is in fact false. So make use of this, uh, this uh, table uh, for the um, type one and type two errors. Um, and uh, as we go through this, we'll actually, I wanna bring that up again. Um, as we go through this, I'll uh, make use of uh, this um, table. Uh, here we have uh, wanting to identify which of these uh, is uh, the type one error. Remember a type one error happens when we reject the null hypothesis that is true. As you look through the choices here, the type one error has to do with rejecting a true null hypothesis. So the correct choice is not going to say fail to reject. So in my choices, I can immediately discount choice two and choice four, because these, if anything, could be type two errors, but we're looking for a type one error description. It says reject the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have a job is less than 88%. Well, when that percentage is actually less than 88%. This one's a little tricky uh, because it, it says the percentage of adults who have a job is less than 80% when the percentage actually is less than 88%. And you might say, well, this is true. It's supporting something true. The trick here is that this is not a null hypothesis. Remember, a null hypothesis, reject the null hypothesis, it says, a null hypothesis has to have an equal sign in it. And this statement, this hypothesis is less than, not less than or equal to, but less than. So this is not a null hypothesis. So we're not going to select this one because although the decision was correct, the thing that you're making the decision about is not a null hypothesis. This one says, reject the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have a job is equal to 80% when the percentage is actually 88%. So we reject equal to when the percentage actually is equal to. So therefore, that would be the example of a type one error. Number four, we're going to use that same um, that same table 
Um, and in number four, uh, on the learning aids, there's uh, the table as well as a YouTube video about type one and type two errors that I think is pretty good. And it asks which of the following is a type two error. And again, the type two error over here is when we fail to reject a null hypothesis, we fail to say it's false when it actually is false. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in the, in the choices we have here, we're looking for something that says we fail to reject. This one says reject the claim, reject the claim. We're not talking about rejecting, we're talking about the idea of failing to reject. So I can discount numbers one and two on my choices. Fail to reject the claim the proportion of settled mouth practice suits is 0.24 when the proportion is actually different than 0.24. So first of all, is this a is this a null hypothesis? The proportion of settled malpractice suits is 0.24. Yes, that is a null hypothesis. It has equal to is or is equal to. The proportion, that would be P, is equal to 0.24. That would be a null hypothesis. We failed to reject that claim. We failed to reject that null hypothesis when the proportion is actually different. So we're supporting this, failing to reject, when the proportion in real life is different, is not equal to. So that would be an example of a type two error. Well, let's read on. Fail to reject the claim the proportion of malpractice, of settled malpractice suits is 0.24 when the proportion actually is 0.24. Fail to reject means support. So we would be supporting the claim, failing to reject the claim that the proportion is equal to 0.24. So we support that when the proportion really is 0.24. Well, that, that'd be an example of a correct decision. So the correct answer here is going to be the fail to reject the claim that the proportion of settled malpractice suits is 0.24 when the proportion is actually different from 0.24. And here we have the correct answer.